Okay, I'm Derek van Heerden, that's Steve, my partner. Uh, we worked together for about 20 years, and as uh, Marie Helene uh, highlighted, we've gone bankrupt about three times. This is one of our bankruptcies that we're living through at the moment. We both had to borrow money to get you. <laughs> we're hoping that the foundation will pay us back, but crossing our fingers. Um, <clears throat> we're, we're, uh, we're, the business plan is awful. Okay, um, we, we both have our own practices, and most of the people that work with us have to either um, work for almost nothing, um, but we have a lot of fun. <clears throat> we start work late, we go home early, um, and uh, typically we are working in places like that. That's, that's where Steve works. We don't work in the same place. That's how come we've worked for 20 years together. Um, and that's what Steve looks out on. He's rehabilitating a piece of land down the south coast, about uh, an hour south of where, I, where, uh, of where I work. And in the wintertime, he watches whales jumping uh, and dolphins. And, and he's rehabilitating a damaged piece of land, which was uh, firstly a banana farm. Then it was probably planted with tomatoes. Then more recently, failed proteas. Uh, and now we're trying to re he's trying to rehabilitate it back to its original Splendor. Um, if you can just, and this is my studio where I where I work. Um, I've lived in a home that I've built my, my, myself, starting very small and getting even smaller. Um, then my children left home, so I moved my studio back home. That was the last bankruptcy, um, and so we have a little, very tight, uh, intimate space. But as I say, I think that, that people who work with us. And we talk about people working with us rather than for us, mainly students, mainly people that are either taking time out from their studies or uh, who are um, between two different things. We had a run of people who worked for us who basically dropped out of architecture after that. They went on to become ecologists or uh, business people or, you know, we, <clears throat> we refer to ourselves as bottom feeders. I don't know if that makes sense in, in, in French. But essentially, we do the work that nobody else really wants to, wants to do. Um, but just a little bit of geography. This, as you know, is Africa. And that would be South Africa. And that would be KwaZulu-Natal, where we, where we work. Durban being the center of the East Coast, hence our name. Um, and the, the, it's about the size of France, Belgium, maybe. Um, certainly probably as big as the British Isles, the province that we live in. So we travel quite extensively around this province to our various projects. We work not exclusively in this province. Some of our projects are, it takes us about eight hours to get to the site, and it will include two aeroplane trips and a rental uh, four by four for probably something like three hours up into the mountains. So getting to these sites is very tricky and very time consuming. Um, this is our own province, the green areas. One thing you must understand about South Africa, and again, I don't want to talk uh, as if I'm giving, giving a, a geography lesson, but land is a big issue. In, it's a decolonizing uh, country at the moment, and land is a constant issue that is on the agenda. Um, the green areas of this, this map of, uh, of my home province is basically owned by uh, one man, literally, um, uh, the Zulu king, uh, King Goodwill, Good, king Goodwill Zuelatini, okay? Um, it's about 40% of the area of our, of our province. When I say he owns it, he has uh, custodianship over it, similar to the crown lands that you might get in the United Kingdom. Um, People live on that land by grace of the king. In other words, if they talk out, they lose their position in this, in this kind of uh, um, uh, uh, sort of area where they live. And essentially what we are dealing with is uh, a population that is deeply invested in land. Essentially, particularly the Zulu culture uh, of my home province, um, there's a strong sense of ancestral sort of homage. I wouldn't call it worship, but certainly a deep kind of connection with ancestry. So the, the place where, they, where your ancestors are buried is the place that you are connected to. 
So even though we have, and notwithstanding anything that has been said by probably more recently uh, one of the recent winners, uh, uh, Alejandro Aravena, who said this is the urban century. I think South Africa is a special case in the sense that we have this kind of sense of urbanization and it is a fastly urbanizing uh, country. We have this connection constantly back to the land. Everybody believes, or certainly most of the people that live in our cities, see themselves as temporary. They don't see themselves in a sense as permanent city dwellers. I would say that at least 50% of our urban residents of first generation migrants from rural areas. And they see themselves as being there for a short period of time until they've made their money or whatever. We know this is not true. We know that in essentially that they will be trapped in the cities, but they constantly want to go back to their rural areas. And that's where we come in. So our provinces basically has competing forces or competing impulses for, for land. We have sugar. It's one of the, you know, the oldest crops in our province was, was sugar. Uh, we have obviously wildlife and tourism that competes with, the, with, with these other impulses. We have beautiful natural areas. This is the Drakensberg, uh, which forms the western boundary of our province. Uh, we have the beautiful oceans and we have uh, surfing. In the background is the stadium that was built in my home city. Uh, for an unbelievable amount of money in, in, tw in 2010 for the World Cup. And this is the consequence. This is where the urban poor have ended up. This is, I w this is probably oof, three kilometers from where I live. Uh, it's a, a, a suburb called Kennedy Road. Uh, in Zulu, it's called Kwadoti, which means the place of dirt. And in the background, there is the major landfill of the city. So these people live on that landfill, not unlike the, the kind of thing that you might see in Brazil. Um, so in this talk, we really are going to talk about two projects that we've done. Uh, Maria Len talked about or mentioned that we work with schools, and schools are probably what we, what we are best at. Um, we have done other projects, we have done other buildings, we've even done buildings in the city itself, but these are the projects, I guess, that we are, are proudest of. Uh, both of these uh, projects were funded by one donor, uh, an NGO that was based in the United States. The first is a school about three hours uh, southwest of Durban called Seven Fountains Primary School. And then that's the one up almost on the Zimbabwean border called Vele Secondary School. Um, and they were both existing communities. We preferred dealing with existing schools. We have 26,000 schools in the country, roughly, and I would say probably two-thirds of those would be in rural areas. Rural schools are quite different to urban schools in the sense that some rural schools would have uh, as few as 200 pupils, whereas urban schools are more likely to be uh, one and a half, maybe even 2,000 uh, uh, learners. So some of the schools are very intimate, and this particular school called Seven Fountains started off as a farm school. For 64 years, it had variously seven to 14 residents, of seven to 14 learners, sorry. And then in about 2000, right? Yeah, around about 2000. Is this mic on? Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. it's on. Um, uh, we were invited to, uh, to, to visit the school um, because what had happened is they'd been evicted from um, a nearby farm. And um, what had happened, the farmer was living on the outskirts of a, of a, a rural town in southern Cosmic Hotel called Kokstad. And um, a, a massive township was built on the outskirts of the town. Um, 25,000 residents moved in almost overnight, and his farm school was swamped. So what he did was, because he wasn't getting any support, there's no government support for farm schools, he burnt the school down. And it, it, uh, it, it reached the press, and uh, the school moved into this um, hostel housing um, in the township, or adjacent to the township. And very quickly, almost overnight, uh, within a few months, uh, the population of the school rose to about 450 learners in eight classrooms. So there was massive overcrowding. There were 12 toilets on the site and one tap. 
And um, it was at that stage, and these are the conditions in the classrooms. Typically, a classroom was 75 learners, and, uh, and teaching wasn't about teaching, as teachers told us. They said it was essentially crowd control. It was a very chaotic situation. So this was the school environment that we were invited to, and um, uh, that, uh, this is the township um, up at the top here. I think what we want to talk about is not necessarily the product that we come up with, but the process that leads to it, because we believe in this kind of environment, and I think, I think that it also just needs to be pointed out that South Africa has a kind of tradition of paternalism. And I mean, this is the paternalism of apartheid. Everyone knows about apartheid, where essentially the government was telling people how to think, where to live, where to sleep, whether they could walk on this pavement or that pavement, etc. There were incredible rules and laws that governed the behavior of the majority of the citizens. But at the same time, there was a kind of an inbred paternalism that is inherent to the African condition, which is about tribalism. And it's about your chief knowing what's good for you, or your Nduna, or your headman, or something. There was always a sort of chain of command. So people were never really ever allowed to express themselves freely. And we found that the, the, the real problem with rural development was not, was not the shortage of development or the shortage of facilities, but the shortage of facilities that were fit for purpose. Most facilities were either abandoned or vandalized because there was a sense of non-ownership, or we interpreted in that way, that ownership was actually the critical key, the critical issue. But in actual fact, people used these facilities, and we understood that when facilities come through a top-down process, that there's gonna be a high level of criticism of these facilities. There's gonna be a high level of rejection of these facilities, and typically this would result in, as I say, high levels of, 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 of vandalism, destruction of property, and quite high levels of antisocial kind of activity in the schools. So we, de we devised processes and, and programs, and they're not cast in stone, they're very fluid and very uh, um, open to kind of suggestion. And, and I was mindful of what we were hearing early on, this idea of, of, of sort of uh, spontaneity, the idea of, of being able to just respond to a, a, a bunch of things that were thrown at us rather than going in with this five-year plan. We, we, we have resisted both either the idea of standardization and the idea of having a preconceived idea about what we are going to build. So the idea is to actually be, comp and, it, and it requires of the architect to be disempowered, to actually say I know nothing, and that's a very difficult thing for a professional to do. We, it's not in our DNA. One of the things as a teacher as well, uh, the idea that every problem that is presented to us has a, has a solution that includes a building. Now this is a fallacy. We have to own up to the fact that sometimes we believe buildings to be way more important than they really are. So the idea that we have to tease this out, uh, that some, some buildings really should not be built. Um, and, and I think that, that we need to, as architects, own up to this, that sometimes we tease buildings out of spaces where there shouldn't be buildings. So we devised a series of, of engagement workshops. We had a community here that was quite traumatized. They just had their school burned down. They'd been evicted. They were homeless. Um, they'd, they'd also experienced the sudden crowding of this new township that was built, houses only, no schools, no clinics, no community halls, no social facilities whatsoever. And, the, and these are sort of, you know, when you hear politicians speak, they talk about sort of quantity. There's never, a, they, they never come up with anything to do with, with quality, okay? It's just how many houses, how many classrooms, how many toilets, and the toilets are just sort of coincidental because most of the learners have got stuff inside them that they need, that they need to get rid of. So this is, uh, a bunch of people that we were working with at the time. This is our, our little mascot at the bottom here called Timber. And we devised workshops to engage with these, um, with these pupils. And I think we resonated um, very much with Fatima as well. Because, uh, you want some water? Yeah. Um, the idea of starting with the kids, um, always there was a lot of suspicion amongst the parents. We spent a lot of time um, um, in, in these places when we first uh, started working. And, uh, and, and we were stopped and asked what we were doing here. We wanted to know what was going on. But we got permission from the school and from the parents to start a, a series of workshops with the kids with no preconceived outcome. It was just to have some fun. Um, we, 
we, we couldn't impose on the spaces within the school because they were so limited, so we had to come up with our own spaces for the workshops. We bought a shipping container, we bought some cheap building sheets, and we created um, shaded spaces, and then we brought in a bunch of experts in, in various fields, for example, artists from Durban um, that we'd worked with, and they ran these programs. And once again, the outcomes weren't uh, preconceived. So we had a, a, an idea of a bunch of creative workshops. The first was a portrait drawing um, program. And the kids came into the space and in a, in a structured way, because um, we wanted to, to keep the record of what was happening, and they each drew a... Uh, yes, closer, sorry. They each drew a portrait of, e of each other um, in pairs. And... Uh, uh, we, sat, we stood back and watched and, uh, and spoke to them and spoke to the teachers and used these days that we spent at the school um, getting an understanding of, of kind of the, the social um, events that were happening, the, the physical infrastructure, their physical needs in that school environment, what was lacking. And, um, and through, you know, one of the miraculous outcomes of, of this process was an amazing body of material. So what we put up in our office at the end of it, one of the outcomes was a series of, at that stage there were 700 kids in the school, 700 portraits who are our ultimate clients that we were working um, towards. We used the, their portraits to adorn um, and decorate our, our drawings and, and we made Christmas cards and ultimately at the end we, uh, we made transfers and we stuck them onto the windows of all the classrooms in the school. And just incidentally, we've been back to the school many times over the years and it's been up there now for seven years. Not a single window has been broken. It was almost a, you know, dare to throw a stone at me type of um, uh, situation. And I think, I think the point that Steve makes is that, uh, is that these things were not directed at looking for answers. They were directed at building a relationship with our client. And I think that, and we stuck these pictures up in our studio and we reminded everybody that was working in our studio at the time, these are your clients. Don't think that the person who's paying for this building is your client. These are your clients. Even though they are temporary, they will move through the school. But the next ones that come, and we were looking at programs like wet cement writing and people actually leaving you know, their mark on, on, the, on the school. And it, and it was towards this idea of ownership. Um, you know, every event was celebrated on arrival with dancing and, and singing, and, uh, and often we, we, we closed the events with a party of some sort. This was a Christmas um, ice cream party we held. And we, the engineers and artists who'd been involved all uh, participated. Um, and then parallel to that process with the learners, we started engaging with parents. We wanted to let them know what we were doing there, who were these strangers um, in their space. Um, so we had a series of, of community meetings. We presented um, some of our ideas. We were starting to put together now some, some structure to a program. And we fed um, a whole newsletter program into that community. Um, it was on a monthly basis. Um, we distributed new newsletters um, in, in multiple languages um, to the learners. And attached to one of those was a questionnaire. And it was a skills and inventory audit of this population of approximately 25,000 people. And it had amazing um, outcomes for us in terms of the skills that we found in that community that, that we hadn't even dreamed of. Um, and, 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 I mean, Derek ran a, a, a teacher visioning workshop at the top there uh, where the teachers participated. And the teachers were, and, and parents were much more um, reticent at these meetings. The kids were much more, were forthcoming. We probably got most of our information about the needs of the school and the community from the learners. And the parents, having, as Derek said, been used to this top-down approach and being told that there will be a school that's going to be built and this is what it's going to look like, were quite in awe of the fact that we were asking them. And I remember one meeting, there was a silence at the end and we asked for people to comment. And one woman just got up and said, she says, I've got nothing to say. I like the project. I'm just so grateful that you asked, though. Um, and uh, so there were these moving uh, um, interactions. And, and I mean, it was great to hear Pat, Patama talking about six months, because this is what we were looking for as well, was just six months. And, and it was astonishing that we had to persuade our, our funder to actually just give us that space. And we were grateful that eventually uh, we got that space to actually just... And this is before a single line got drawn, uh, although we saw some drawings, and these were the sort of initial drawings that, that, that we, that, that we uh, had done. Um, but what happened then was once construction actually started, and the construction was, is, is nothing, uh, nothing special. You know, simple uh, kind of robust architecture, 
uh, obviously we, 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 we kind of, we're the experts in things like passive design and we know about orientation, we know about insulation, so we got all those things right, but the sense of kind of inclusion in, and, and we weren't talking about participative design, we were still the designers, we retained the right to design, but we wanted to do it within the context of transparency, of a, a, a positive and beneficial relationship with our client. And this, is, this seems so simple, and yet so few of my colleagues actually want to actually get out of their air-conditioned offices to engage with the clients that they, you know, that they really should be engaging with. So, so this, this, yeah. Yeah, the Skills and Materials Audit um, informed us that there was a, um, a team of uh, women, in particular in this community, who are actually adding onto their homes um, using earth, earth construction. And uh, we designed some of the, the structures in the um, school um, using Adobe building techniques. Um, the round classroom was a request of the teachers. They wanted to have their art and drama classes in a round space, um, you know, reflecting a, a cultural uh, uh, desire. And then we, we went back to, to, to have a look at the way that um, Adobe buildings were, were being built in this community, and they were being very badly built. They almost had only a year's life cycle. Um, they were added on typically to the standard uh, township house, the concrete block house, um, but they were collapsing. And, and, and I think one of the main problems that we, we picked up pretty quickly was there was, there was a cement um, component to this construction, um, which was damaging the integrity of Adobe building. Um, and we, at this stage, we brought on board um, uh, some experts. And Andy Horn is a, a master builder in uh, natural building techniques in South Africa. And he ran a series of what we call master classes with um, particularly these women that we, we, we'd identified quite early on. They were all unemployed mothers of learners at the school. We had a team of 18 of them, and they were paid but through the project to make um, adobe bricks initially. So we looked at the, 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 the mold sizes, we looked at mixes, um, and we coached them through this process. And they made all of the bricks. In the end, a total of 16,000 bricks um, over about a month. Um, and all the bricks were tested uh, for strength. And we showed them how to, to, to cure them, how to stack them. Um, and then this was the celebration at the end um, when, when the brick making process was complete. Um, yeah, Derek, you want to carry on? Yeah, yeah. I just want to butt in here. I think that the idea of uh, of correcting or, or, or basically going back to knowledge that had been forgotten. These are traditional techniques. I mean, this is a technique that was used in the Nile Delta thousands of years ago. It's a simple wet process of taking earth with about 6% clay content, mixing, mixing it with uh, wheat straw, uh, putting it into a mold, letting it dry, laying it with the same material, there was this misconception that if I add in a little bit, bit of cement, it would last longer. In actual fact, it had the opposite impact. It destroyed the wall completely. The sheets of, of, you know, you'd get the, the bricks just almost being eaten away by the cancer of the cement, and you would almost just get the, the mortar joints left, which would be the, but the, the, the bricks would disappear. They were also using molds that were way too uh, big, okay? The first thing we did was we, we reduced the mold by about 75%, uh, uh, about a quarter of the size of the brick. The brick could be laid easier. All of this is done by old women, typically. We're talking about an area where uh, there is a sort of a, a migrant labor. Most of the young, able men move to the cities to get jobs, leaving behind the woman and typically the older woman or the grannies, uh, and they would be doing the construction. So with these big bricks, they could only get them up so high, and then they would put the roof on. With the smaller brick, they could go much higher. The bricks cured quicker. It was a win-win situation all around. Yeah, so Andy came back and he ran another program. Uh, we went through the building process and we made sure the building was founded on a, on a solid base. Um, and um, and these, the same group of women essentially built the building. Um, and here's the completed building. The roof's going on now. Um, it was a thatch roof. And, um, and we got to the stage where the building needed to be plastered. Andy came back for a third uh, workshop session um, around uh, uh, plastering techniques, earth-based plasters, um, mixed with the straw. And we, we came across a, a bit of a challenge at this stage because we had this team of women. We had to quickly make plaster and plaster the building. It's not something like the bricks where you could actually you know, make the bricks and put them aside and build later. The process is much more immediate. And the women, the small team of women were battling, and we saw that the kids, because the school, the main school had now been occupied, the kids were having their physical education classes at the same time, running around, exercising on the sports field. We went back to the school now, who we had this really amazing relationship with now, and said, can we kind of, there's, there's an overlap here, surely. 
And the school allowed us to send the kids out a class at a time, and they mixed um, the, uh, the plasters with the women who, you know, they all knew as community members. And the, the kids mixed the, the plaster for the, for, the, uh, for the building, and the building was plastered pretty quickly. And this gives you an idea of the end product that came out of that space. Um, and it's now become a community centre, this, this building, in the school, because now the community want to use it for meetings, and there's a lot of music happens in it. Um, it's become an important, uh, not just a building in the school, but a building in that community. One, um, of, one of the issues that was raised when we, we, when we visioned this, this school with, uh, with both parents and teachers was this concern about the loss of culture, the concern about uh, you know, the love of round, round buildings. Now, it's very difficult to make classrooms round in terms of the kind of furniture that goes into it. They call, so that's where the modern, what they call, um, I'm a four corner, which is a square house. It's, a, it's got four corners, and it's really a derivative of the kind of furniture that goes into it, and the beds and the, the, the cupboards and things like that. But here we had the opportunity of, of actually expressing this culture in some sort of round houses. So this is really a signature building rather than the whole school. It was an interesting context to this, though, but nationwide at the same time, there was a program to demolish what they call mud buildings in schools, um, which were typically poorly built. Um, and there was, this was met with a lot of horror um, amongst uh, politicians and, uh, um, and government structures that we were building a mud school in the midst of a demolition program uh, nationwide. Um, there was another small, uh, well, there were a lot of actually workshop programs, and this is a very abbreviated um, uh, demonstration of some of the, 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 the work that we did. But in parallel to that, uh, we did a mural painting um, workshop with a team of artists um, who came and worked with this, uh, another team of, of, of women from that community, and they decorated a lot of the panels um, at the school. And here's the end product um, of um, Seven Fountains Primary School, just some of the external spaces, examples of a lot of the local fired clay brick um, that we used, uh, which was sourced from uh, about 20 kilometers from the school. Um, so it's something like 80% of the materials from the school were sourced from, from, um, from within about between 20 and 30 kilometers. And it's, it, I know it's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a kind of given concept now in green building, but it, it was pretty unheard of um, at, at that stage. Um, and some of the internal spaces, lots of natural, natural light and ventilation, some innovation in terms of the type of classroom environments we were creating with mezzanine, you know, double volume. Um, spaces and separation of zones in the school so that we separated the, the very small learners in grade R through a series of courtyards or a hierarchy of courtyards right the way through to the, the senior learners who were sort of uh, 12, 13, 14 years old. And were, these were things we picked up um, in our early days in interacting with the kids. And then just some of the solar control devices um, that we ended up applying to the building as, as a sort of final layer and just very simple bent um, sheeting, galvanized sheeting. Um, it cost almost nothing to do this, and just different treatments um, with the use of a, the expert in, um, uh, input of a, of a um, passive design engineer, Paul Carew. So we had different treatments to the west elevation on the bottom here, to the, to the north elevation, and, and light shelves, and southern um, um, shading and, 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 and light on verandas. Um, and one of the, 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 the fortunate outcomes of this process is we, got, we managed to get a, a donation from an electronics company for a whole series of metering and censoring devices, because we were, we were very interested to how, in, in, in finding out how this building was performing. We had a good idea that we were following good practice. So we managed to install um, sensors and metering devices um, throughout the school. We measured water consumption, um, we measured um, light switching and electric, uh, electrical usage patterns, and we measured uh, um, uh, lighting in classrooms, indoor and outdoor temperatures. We had a digital weather station. Um, electricity consumption, and then it, um, at the top there you'll see uh, we put probes in, into the different wall systems. So the Adobe wall system as against the, the fired clay brick system were measured internally in terms of temperature. And one of the outcomes that we, it, this informed a lot of the schools that we did after this, but um, it was very interesting to find out that, and, 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 and encouraging to find out that our um, school, the, these classroom spaces were typically 15 degrees warmer in the middle of winter um, in the classroom than outdoors. And because we put a control in a nearby standard government school, we found out the classrooms were five to 10 degrees warmer than the classroom spaces in midwinter at that school. I mean, typically in, 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 this, in this town, Coxstadt, which experiences bitterly cold winters, uh, approximately 25% of kids were absent on, on, on an average winter day. 
Now, you can't teach a kid if he's at home. I mean, he might be learning other stuff, but he's certainly not going to be learning the curriculum. Now we have absolutely zero absenteeism. They come to school because the school is warmer than their homes, uh, and we consider that to be a win. <clears throat> okay, the second project we want to talk about is the, is the Far North School. This is the one that takes us eight hours to get to. This is called Vela Secondary School. Um, and again, we were, uh, after a long process of selection, uh, the same donor w w saw that first school and she said, let's do another one and put a kind of word out and this was the school that was selected. Um, this is in Limpopo province. It's far from where we live. It's a very alien culture. This is uh, uh, the land of what they call the Chivenda or uh, quite similar to the Zimbabwean Shona. They speak a, la a language full of uh, um, accents. It's, it's, it's about as foreign... Uh, to us English speakers as, 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 uh, as, as French, I guess. Uh, um, and this is how we, f how we found the school. Uh, very, very run down. Uh, again, about six classrooms for probably 650 learners. Uh, most of the kids would have to be learning outdoors. Uh, typically this, this idea, and, and the question comes up, and I mean, I like Patama putting the sort of questions to us. One of the questions that we had to answer was, uh, is it better to have a good teacher under a tree or a poor teacher in a perfect classroom? Um, the real issue there is if you've got a, a, a good teacher under a tree, uh, the chances of hanging on to that good teacher are almost zero. Okay? That teacher is expected to be uh, a saint if, 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 if that good teacher stays at that school. That teacher would start looking for a, a transfer to another school. And a striking uh, situation or condition at this school was um, the toilets there, as you see, um, uh, four toilets. That was the girls' toilets for the school. And as a result of that, girl absenteeism at the school was very high. So uh, I think the figures were, you know, a third of the girls at any one time were not attending school. Um, kids were walking long distances. As Derek said, classrooms were crowded up to 100 kids per classroom. Um, one, one of the things that we immediately recognized that we knew nothing about this place. It was alien to us both environmentally, culturally. Uh, we, the trees were, were different to the trees that we recognized. So we, we immediately developed a, a workshop where we said to the kids, you be the teacher, tell us about your area. So we, we gave each uh, student uh, or each learner a, a disposable camera uh, and we told them to go away and, br and bring us back the cameras and, sh and, and tell us about this area. Uh, we had a few sort of ground rules, uh, just a little bit of photography, have the light behind you, and they weren't allowed to take uh, photographs of anybody that didn't want to be photographed, and certainly they weren't allowed to take photographs of their sisters in the nude. Um, and we got some fantastic results back from this. Yeah, we got 5,000 photographs back from, from these kids. Um, these were film cameras, so we took the, uh, we asked the school to courier the, the box load of cameras back to us at the end of the, the workshop. Um, they had a month. Uh, to gather these photos, and each camera was 25 um, uh, shots. And uh, so these 5,000 uh, uh, cameras came back. We had them processed and, and printed, um, and then digitized, and we kept a, a, a copy for ourselves. Um, but w one of the things that came out was uh, five themes in particular. They have magnificent landscape and the beauty of, 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 of the place, of this environment. The importance of agriculture. I mean, this is an agriculture-based um, um, uh, uh, part of the South Africa, and, uh, and in particular subsistence agriculture. I think a lot of these people were genuinely living off the land. Um, a sense of the, the homes that people were building for themselves. It's very simple round or square dwellings and rooms, but beautiful external spaces, and, um, and the use of materials, the, uh, the role that, that women played um, in construction, um, and the strong sense of community, so family and friends, and. Uh, and, and, and so we, these were kids, we were, we were only meeting them at the school, in their uniform, in the classes, and, and here we got a, a lesson in where they, where they went to and how their lives were outside school. Um, and then once again, back to agriculture, the importance of animals and farm animals um, in particular. And we printed these out, um, and we kept them in, in, um, in groups per, per learner, and we took them back to the school. We had a massive exhibition day, which was a, a huge event at the school, and the kids took away their, uh, their photos as, as a memento. But meanwhile, we had this uh, wonderful resource and, and, and insights. 
And because the photographs were not digitized, we had uh, uh, slideshows on all of our computers running, you know, whenever, you know, that, that kind of uh, Windows kind of effect that you can have this kind of running slideshow in, in the background. So it was just a way of getting our staff also, um, I guess, indoctrinated into this area or sort of being, certainly enculturated into what they were doing. Um, the second workshop that we decided to run there was to find out what sort of area we were dealing with. So we did a mapping workshop and we asked each, we, we printed these big uh, uh, aerial photographs of the area and we asked each people to come up and with a, with a mark to actually say where they lived. And that was incredibly revealing. We were finding some, some of the people were working, walking three hours to get to school. Three hours in the morning, three hours in the evening, which, which led to a whole bunch of design issues. Kids can't carry books in case they get caught in the rain. They have to do their homework at school. We have to have lockers for them to lock their school, their, their, their books up with. We had to devise ways in which, you know, one of the kids came to me, you know, and he, you know, I said, in winter you must be walking home in the dark. He said, yeah. So I said, are you scared? He said, yeah. He says, what do you think I'm scared of? I said, I don't know, bad people, muggers. He says, I'm scared of leopards. They have the highest population in these hills of wild leopards in southern Africa. So they get chased by leopards, by warthogs, by bush pigs, all sorts of things. And these are real issues for rural uh, inhabitants. Yeah, and, and we gave the sheets to the kids to take home with them, um, and, uh, and we asked them to tell stories. But more interesting than the stories were actually the drawings that came back. Um, kids started designing their classrooms. They wanted a double story, for example. It was an important um, uh, uh, thing for them. And, uh, and stories about the school environment and the, the teaching under the tree and how difficult things were. Um, and then a lot of poems. Uh, but the sense of distance, I think, was probably the most important on, you know, um, a lot of the kids walking up to 10 kilometers each way per day. And running parallel to that, once again, um, so we're working with the kids and working with the parents and the teachers um, and, and with a newsletter program um, that's being circulated um, and a questionnaire f with a skills audit, um, and which led us to the construction process. And as a result of that skills audit, we had um, on our inventory um, a few thousand in the end um, uh, skills and contact um, uh, details of people within this community who we worked closely with the contractor when he was appointed, and he employed particularly a lot of women. 100% um, of the labor force for this school were built, uh, were, were sourced from, from this community, and many of the um, semi-skilled and skilled um, laborers, and a lot of the, um, the people employed there were women. Um, Rachel was our safety officer throughout the whole program, um, and, and women did uh, a, a lot of major tasks. The stonemasons, uh, this is a stone building community, um, and we built a lot of the buildings out of stone, um, all uh, done by local stonemasons using um, local skills and local material, and a team of deaf carpenters who put all the roofs um, onto the, uh, the structures at the school. So this is how we found the school. Um, essentially two blocks. These are the toilets, and there were between five and 600 learners at the stage when we arrived here. And because there were was, there was so, so few um, uh, facilities in this community, com uh, social facilities, this was a shared facility. These were the sports fields for this community and the school. Um, and these um, uh, classrooms were used for adult education. And this is how we left the school. Um, and just for the sake of time, just quickly run through uh, the school environment. Uh, these are some of the outdoor spaces, the use of, of local materials, the spaces that we created between buildings and the treatment of spaces between buildings and the importance of those. Um, you, because of the agricultural and botanical richness of the area, we did a lot of green roofs. There were food gardens at the heart of the school, um, and those became integrated into the teaching processes, um, and, and flower gardens everywhere as well. And then a lot of natural light. So these were the, um, the ablutions at the end, at the top here. Um, a lot of natural light and ventilation um, into all the spaces. And then once again, this, this idea of monitoring um, the systems at the school, particularly water and energy, but with a different um, slant this time, because at a high school we had an opportunity for the buildings to become teachers themselves. And we, so we put, it made everything very explicit. I mean, the, the energy consumption at the school was displayed um, on the school intranet, because the school now had computers, the new school, and, and then the reception area, energy, um, electricity consumption from the renewable sources and from um, the main supply was shown throughout the school. Um, we had a series of posters throughout the school showing how all of these systems worked, and the water uh, recycling for, for flushing of toilets was, was very explicit. 
what's interesting is that this school is on a sort of a tourist route. It sits almost somewhere between Kruger National Park, which is quite a well-known sort of game reserve in, in, in southern Africa, and the route to Zimbabwe, which is... Uh, and so uh, we, we, we managed to train up a couple of kids as tour guides, and they now have tourists visiting the school. Uh, and so these posters have a kind of a double uh, uh, sort of purpose in the sense that everything is kind of informative. And uh, they get, uh, I don't know what the numbers are, but a couple of hundred students uh, probably in a, in a tourist a couple of hundred tourists in a, a, over a season, um, all of whom kind of start to feel connected to the school and hopefully they'll pull out some euros or you know some pounds or whatever. Um, these, these communities are bitterly poor, okay? Um, our, our, our job is to reduce their dependence on things like uh, uh, ESCOM electricity, that's our sort of utility that, that generates electricity, uh, enormously expensive, has become expensive over the years, still coal-fired uh, power stations. Uh, so, you know, it's, it's, we, we feel that we're kind of solving a few problems at once, but essentially it's to reduce the burden of cost to these communities, uh, well, as far as possible. And, and two significant measurable um, outcomes for us, important ones, were girl attendance at the school. It's 100% now. Um, and, uh, and, and partly as a result of that, we've got um, academic improvement. When we, when we started working with school, the, the final year in grade 12, there was a 39% pass rate. It's now at 93, and it's plateaued um, at, at that. So that's been uh, substantial. I think we're getting a time uh, message. <laughs> so we are just winding up. Yeah. So, I mean, th these are drops in the ocean in terms of the bigger condition of education in the country. As I say, we've probably got 26,000 schools. Probably about half of those are still on uh, completely inadequate kind of infrastructural kind of support in terms of pit latrines, water supply, electricity supply, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, there's enormous kind of agitation at the moment in, in our country from a, a couple of uh, uh, social uh, groups, uh, equal education being one of them, another one being Section 27. And literally, as we speak, kids are marching for the development of their schools by the government who, you know, I don't, I'm not starry out about what, I, what our government has to do, but, uh, and essentially they're very distracted by other sort of issues at the moment, but they are avoidant of, the, of their responsibility towards these schools. And we believe that we, we have the answer, we just want, we need to be asked, uh, you know, how to do it, that's all. And that's it. Thank you. Thank you.